Hi, and welcome to the Christian Surfers Talk Story podcast. In today's episode, we speak with Brett Davis as he reflects on his past and looks, more importantly, towards the future. He gives us some insight on mentorship and what it's like to grow up as a grom within Christian Surfers. I hope you enjoy. Have a great one. Hey guys and aloha. It's Mark Sawyer Chu. And AJ Ellerington. Together, we'll be hosting the Christian Surfers Podcast, where we talk Jesus and talk with surfers that love Jesus. Tune in to hear some amazing stories. Today, we have the legend, Brett Davis, with us. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling really good, really good. Now, we know you as the founder of Christian Surfers. You've done and pioneered some incredible things over the years that many of you have heard about, but I want us to delve a little bit into what you're doing right now and what you're looking forward to in the future. Thank you. Um, yeah, most people want me to talk about the past. Yeah. Uh, and past is past, and I'm happy to celebrate that. But I'm actually more excited about the future and what I'm currently doing now. So if we go back, I had a four-year transition yeah. out of my founding international director role, which had run for 16 years, visiting wow. every continent every year for 16 years, which some people think sounds like the dream holiday, but it's like a extended long bus, <laughs> bus trip, uh, but to but wonderful exactly. people. Um, yeah. So the end of that transition, um, there have been, I'll say that there have been four things that have emerged. Um, one was that I shifted sideways, very thankful to Roy Harley saying, we're going to create Amazing a new person. title for you. So I became the founder advisor, <laughs> which um, means that I get to float around and just give encouragement and connections. Yeah, impart incredible wisdom oh, into all the groms. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if I had been the father of Christian surfers, now I'm the grandfather, which means I get to play with the child and hand it back to the responsible one. That's kind of what we're doing today. Yes, that's right. So I'm so glad to do that. So that's my um, exciting part of Christian sur- surfers now. I mostly mentor key national leaders and a couple of others. Yeah. I've got a couple of 19 year old kids um, in my hometown. So that's the Christian Surfers International. The um, Global Action Sports Ministry Network called ACTS um, had been started and I'd pulled together some people and it gave me the bandwidth to invest more in other action sports. The foundation that I had with Christian Surfers as the longest running action sports ministry in the world was the mission that other people looked to for yeah. encouragement, inspiration, uh, just a hope that I could hang in there. If you, if you guys could do it, maybe we could do it in this skate ministry or this snowboarding ministry or whatever. So to have more time for that was so... Huge so, blessing. Yeah, really good. And that was a sweet spot for me to just take, take that same network in one sport and just multiply it and to encourage other people that maybe God could use you to do the same thing. And obviously you have... Um, as you said, you travel a lot and you've been to multiple places doing mission. And how have you been able to be part of your local community uh, and kind question. of, you know, on a, on yes. a more yes. small scale yes. basis? Um, one of the keys to my sanity, mm-hmm. I'll say even more than success, <laughs> to sanity is if you get spread so wide globally, but you aren't anchored locally, you can just be swallowed up in all of this. So I was very much committed to be invested locally, uh, being anchored locally, even to go deep locally, whilst I was spread globally. So that would be one of the third aspects of what I do now is that I'm still really invested in my local community. I've been living in the one house that I built with my uh, neighbor, we took uh, seven months off work and built two houses together for each other so we could be in ministry. We still live on the same block of land and I've been there for 33 years. So consequently, that means you've accumulated a lot of depth locally. And when COVID came and I couldn't travel anyway, um, I've started multiple expressions and pioneering new expressions of a local surf ministry. That's with the Shaping Bay for older guys. Got a Shaping Bay Junior for- um, Wait, so you shape that you shape? 
Uh, it's called the shaping bay okay. as an analogy. Okay, okay. So, what does that mean? Um, so, using the analogy of a, every surf surfer identifies with the shaping bay, where a surf was shaped and refined. We meet as a cross generational community of male surfers hey. to shape one another. It's Christian surfers trading as the shaping bay. None of the guys that would come, they wouldn't go to a church and they wouldn't go to Christian surfers. But they will come to a community engagement group facilitated by Christian surfers. So uh, I started this when I was uh, having run a teenage grown group for 40 years in multiple places to actually start something for the first time for my peer group and people around that, which was unimaginable. Yeah. So that's been awesome. Yeah, wow. Exciting present and an even more incredible future to come. Surfing's a big part of your life. Um, has it ever taken control or has your focus been a bit more centered on surfing rather than other things at times? Yeah, that's a good, um, good question. Um, certainly surfing's been at times, especially when I was younger, a real, um, it was such a compulsive, obsessive thing to be, if, if there were good ways I had to surf. Yeah. Um, I would want to be improving all the time. Mm -hmm. At my stage and age of life where your surfing's been in decline for now half of my life, really. No, don't uh, say that. It's like um, great to be freed up that now it's not what I surf and not how well I surf, but yeah. it's become more who I surf with. Wow. Who I surf with. And I'm increasingly using the language even when uh, Jesus called Peter to come follow me and he said, I'll make you fishers of men. He's saying to Peter, the fisherman, there's bigger fish to catch. Yeah. And I'm trying to get the same mentality in my surfing. And I often say to my wife, I caught eight waves and four conversations because I'm not only there to catch waves, I'm there to catch people. Yeah. And so catching conversations is as important, maybe more important now. Um, I'm still energetic in the water. Yeah. I feel that I still, God's given me a lot of energy but I'm trying to be a bit more focused. So yes, there's been times when that season has been more obsessive. No, now, and in terms of anything else I focus on, a fourth area of my life of the Christian Service International, there's the action sports, yeah. there's my local, is uh, woodwork. I uh, have my own, um, I've developed my own part-time woodworking business, community woodworking. Now, do people know engaging. about this? Um, some do. It's uh, called Wood Stories because every piece has a story. So I do um, bowl turning. I make bowls on a wood lathe out of exotic timbers, which has its own theme. And I teach people in my garage. I have two lathes. I have parent, child. I have couples. I have friends. And they make something together. I do treehouse consultancy and builds. Can I just say, I am blown away. This is the coolest thing I've heard. All yeah, day. this isn't in the book. Um, so I, but I tell people I don't really build tree houses. I build families. Yeah. I build families by you building a tree house platform together. And I don't build for people, I only build with people. So Castles in the Sky Treehouse Consultancy is my little treehouse site. Then I make timber alaya surfboards. I do alaya surfboard classes once a year usually. Uh, a friend runs a woodwork school. And lastly, I mill my own timber. I save exotic trees from the chipper from various arborists. I chainsaw, cut it up, I store it, and then use it or on sell it. So Wood Stories is my little one day a week community woodworking sideline. Absolutely love that. I did used to be a woodwork high school teacher in a former life. It was my background. Well, that's how I guess it came to be. And my, all your passions seem to have uh, a purpose and a ministry. I think that's so incredible. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. just surfing, you know? Yeah, it's got to be our whole life, you know, um, for sure. Now, um, looking towards the future again, that seems to be a bit of the theme for today's podcast. Is there anything that you would do differently um, in terms of how you equip and mentor people that you wish people had done with you when you were younger? Wow, yes. Um, well, first, you can't give what you've not received. And I've been out front 
with no one ahead of me since I was 18 years old. So I was never mentored. Um, so, yeah, and I was naive enough to think that I was competent and capable and probably a little fearful to be, you know, to risk being exposed and not really having had too much um, fathering in my own personal life. Mm -hmm. I just had to just get on and do it myself. So um, I would say I was a really poor mentor for most yeah. of my life. And I used people to build projects, whereas now I probably use projects to build people. And it's only been in this transition that I've really embraced the idea of what it could even be to be a mentor. And I've been mentored by some books and I've been mentored by a couple of conferences and there's been a couple of older people in more recent times. But honestly, AJ, this is the new season of my life as yeah. well. Um, I had the age of the king and then there was God called me to the age of the sage. The age of the king was all about going wider. The age of the sage is to go deeper and I've had to discipline myself and I haven't read a book on leadership in six years, not once. It's all been about going deeper. Yeah. It's about slowing down. It's about not being so rushed and being able to spend more time with people. So that foundation, I wish at a much earlier age I had been wise enough. I wish someone had noticed me. It yeah, how did few. that make you feel? Um, you, know, you just don't even think about it at the time. I mean, my wife and I didn't even get marriage counselling because you guys are fine, you're leaders, you know. So when you've been out front for so long and you've been responsible and capable, it's easy to be overlooked. So I try to notice now that when I talk with leaders and ask a few questions to find out, is anyone really looking out for them? Are they really uh, in that kind of... Um, got that safety net, that, that mentoring, that encouragement. Um, so I continue to stretch myself by the things that I'm reading, by the people that I interact with. I am involved now in some mentoring networks. So um, men's ministry is something I do much more of. So I've pioneered an Australian men's ministry network. You're a busy influence. man. Yeah, yeah. So we, we have a men's ministry influences of Australia. Um, last week in Denver, I had lunch with John Eldridge and Morgan Snyder, who uh, authored the book Wild at Heart, and trying to think how can we do better with mentoring in Australia and men's stuff. So God's basically, ever since I left my international director role in Christian Surfers Australia, my world just got bigger and bigger and bigger. When you let go of something, it's amazing to see where God can take it. So. It's great. That's very um, inspirational. And so to a young person who is maybe seeking mentorship, what advice would you give? Like, how do you go out and do you wait around or do you go and ask people? Good. Yeah. Um, some people have the confidence to ask and approach a, a mentor. And I think um, that's important, but equally, it's good to be noticed by someone and being called and invited to that mentorship. Um, both of those situations are not my personal one. And so I would say to any younger person, and one of my greatest regrets is that I didn't, well, is a regret that no one noticed me, yeah. but there's also a regret that I wasn't confident enough to ask for the help and just assumed I could put my head down and just get on with the job. So um, I would say to any young person, find someone that you trust and uh, invite that person into a relationship where it's mutually listened to one another and being encouraged because some mentors yeah. are not a good fit. Some people, True. as you know, um, uh, and some older guys uh, disqualify themselves because they think, I don't have my own crap together, I couldn't be a mentor. To which I say, if you're aware that you don't have your crap together, doesn't disqualify, that's what actually qualifies you. And secondly, they say, well, no young person would want to listen, doesn't want to hear from an old guy. I go, well, if you want to lecture them, they don't want to hear yeah. from you. But if you posture yourself to listen, you'll have, you a, want to have a, conversation. a conversation. So to invite an older person uh, into that uh, you could even be helping 
raise a mentor as much as you being a mentee. So it can go both ways. That's the way it should. If you were to go back and if you were to have someone notice you at that young age, how do you think that would have changed you personally? Mm. Um, that person probably would have encouraged me to um, have a little more depth, to be a bit more contemplative and reflective rather than just be so task orientated. They would have picked up the flaws in my leadership where I probably didn't care for people. I cared for the project and used the people to build the project. Yeah. So I probably burnt a bunch of people along the way, naively, not intentionally. That would have changed and uh, probably would have saved a lot of stress and strain in a marriage with both of us being first generation Christians, my wife and I. I had no idea what a Christian marriage should look like, what should Christian parenting look like. It's really hard to give what you've not received. Mm -hmm. And if someone had have noticed that, maybe we could have saved ourselves a bunch of pain as well, because yeah. I made plenty of mistakes um, along the way. And the assumption was, because you're a Christian leader, you, know, you, you, got, it, you got it all sorted. Well guys, I really enjoyed that conversation with Brett. I love how he showed us that we can use every gifting we have in a way of ministry and for the glory of God. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did um, and I can't wait to have you listen to the next episode with us. See ya!